All right, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Lasting Learning Podcast. This week, you picked a good one to listen to. This is an epic, epic episode because I have an absolutely incredible guest on the show. We've got a woman on who has inspired me for a few years. I mean, she, she truly inspires me to say the things that need to be said, but say them with a smile. She is a woman with pure joy in her heart coming from the heart of Arkansas. She is from literally the middle of Arkansas, but she is changing the world of education because she has grace, she has compassion, and a little bit of Southern spunk. I am so happy to have this joyful leader on with us today. Bethany Hill, thank you so much for joining us on the Lasting Learning Podcast. Thank you so much, Dave, for inviting me here. I'm so, I'm thrilled. Absolutely. Uh, this is, I, I am definitely thrilled. Um, truly, just being able to sit down and have a conversation with you is, it's a bucket list item, really. So, so thank you so much for being here. Uh, in, there might be a couple of people listening to this because this podcast is international. There might be some people that may, maybe are at the base of the Himalayas or something and they've never heard of you before. Do you mind just illuminating them to what they've missed out on? Who is Bethany Hill? Oh, you're making me blush. <laughs> Um, well, I, uh, I have been in education for 23 years. I'm from a, a town just outside of Little Rock, Arkansas, named Cabot, and I've lived here my entire life. Um, went to school um, and graduated from the same district that I came back to serve in for all these years. So um, that's been really awesome. And, and I've watched my children grow up in the same district that, that I was able to grow up in. Um, this is my 23rd year. I've been a, I've taught kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade. I've been an instructional coach, an assistant principal, and a, and a principal um, as well. And so um, all of it is in, all of my experiences in one district. And so that was one of the reasons why um, I connected with people on Twitter is I really started to see what else was out there um, outside of my little you know, my little small community. Um, and that's, you know, has been the biggest learning for me to be able to connect with people all over the country and all over the world and learn um, from different educators and different situations and everything. So that's been exciting for me. And that's actually how you and I connected um, a few years ago too. So um, I'm, I'm married, have two boys. My oldest son is a teacher and a coach. And my youngest is about to graduate in May and head off to college. So I'll be an empty nester in these next few months. Oh, I'm not God looking bless forward to that. You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, you know, I, I've had this conversation um, on my heart, on my mind for a long time. I've been wanting to, to talk to you. And honestly, it was just a matter of me having the courage to reach out. Um, and I'm so glad I did because I, I have literally an entire notebook full of things. I, I just want to ask you selfishly and um, – on, on personally, professionally, because I, I feel like you are just this wealth of wisdom. And I, I want to pick your brain. And I'm glad that we're recording this. Other people can listen in as we just chat and talk. Uh, so do you mind if I just kind of like just go through some of these things that I've, I've been dying to ask you for years now? Sure. Okay. Um, I'll try to be, I'll try to um, keep it as interesting as possible. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> so when you and I first started connecting on social media, um, I, I was living down in the deep south. I was uh, just outside of southern Alabama, northern Florida. Uh, I was working at a school that had high poverty. Uh, in the state of Florida, they, they rate all their schools A through F. I, I came down to, to take over and quote unquote, turn around this historically struggling school. And I remember when I came down there, I felt like such an outsider. I had all these ideas that so many others looked at as radical and progressive and too innovative, whatever the case may be. And it was a struggle at times to really um, find my way in a, in, in a school that was so in, enriched and entrenched in tradition, which I, I, I mean, God bless the South culture and tradition are so valuable and so important. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm curious about you when you say that you are in the same place that you grew up, you, you are, I'm going to, I'm totally stereotype you right now, but you are the stereotypical Southern belle. You are from the <laughs> South. You love the South. You eat and breathe the South. 
literally working in the same place that you grew up as a child. Um, but yet, when I see you on social media, when I see the ideas and the, the thoughts that you share with the world, they seem so, I, I guess I'll use the same words I used a few minutes ago, progressive and innovative and outside of the norm. So I, I'm wondering, where did, where did that voice come from? From this, this woman who is, is home, and this has always been home. Where did you get the, 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 uh, the audacity, the nerve, the gumption to start sharing different ideas? Um, well, when I, when I transitioned from teacher to administrator, many years ago, um, it was a big learning curve for me. Uh, I had always, you know, focused on my 25 kids in my classroom and, um, you know, just, I guess as a lot of teachers do, uh, you know, pour my heart and soul into that every single year. And um, when I became an administrator and found myself having 400 to 500 students, um, all coming from different backgrounds and, and with different needs, um, it, it really opened my eyes a lot. And when I transitioned to principal um, to another school, um, it was a poverty school and there was just a different dynamic there than mm -hmm. I had ever seen before um, because I had worked in the more affluent schools in my community. And what I started to see in a lot of my kids was what I was when I was a little girl. Um, I, you know, I have, I have I had great parents who, who loved me unconditionally, but we were very poor. We um, came, you know, came from poverty and it was a generational type of poverty. And my house was very chaotic and um, busy and loud and, you know, lots of, lots of things went on when I was a little girl. I had a lot of anxiety and um, I was that kid who went to first grade and um, was, in tears and maybe even under my desk or under a table because I was, I was too, um, too anxious to be around a group of, of kids. Um, I, I was that kid, <laughs> the, the teacher, you know, the principal who goes and has to pick up the child, you know, at the door because she's under a table. Um, I, I started to think back at, you know, my elementary years and realized that I had been through quite a, a bit myself. And um, over the five years I served as principal in the school, um, I learned so much from kids who had exhibited so much resilience, who had been through even more than I could ever even imagine. But I discovered um, what adverse childhood experiences were, and I really started to dig into that and research um, what those are and the effects of trauma on the brain. And um, the, the, the more I studied, the more I researched, the more I um, started to face my own trauma from, you know, from childhood, from different things that had happened and realized that my A score was pretty high. Um, it's actually a seven. And so, I, you know, I was very close to being a statistic. I could have been at any time. And um, I was fortunate enough to have a mom and dad who pushed me to do way more than I ever imagined I could do. Um, and so I ended up being the first one to go to college in my family and, and to, you know, get a, get a degree and get a master's degree and, um, you know, and really have a career um, based on my education. And so that was so important to my, to my parents and, um, you know, and to me too. So, and it was something, honestly, I didn't know if I would ever get to do because I didn't really have the money to make it happen. Um, and so when I started thinking about all these kids going through different things and seeing how I was, you know, sort of um, a cycle breaker in a way, um, it just inspired me to look at kids and be able to help them build a future story in spite of their circumstances and to not be the victim of their surroundings because it's so easy to get sucked into that and to, to be, um, just hopeless and to not be able to see outside of, of, of the circumstances that you're living in. And, um, you know, it, to me, that's, that's, that's the purpose of education, even though it's kind of washed out into all the other mandates and expectations and basic things that we have to um, have in place in schools. And it's really not, um, 
aligns that much with college and career readiness as much as it is ready for life. So we're teaching the, the, the content and the, um, the, the, all of the, the skills and everything that we need to get into college, but we've not focused enough on career and on just being a good human um, and being able to contribute to their, you know, to their surroundings. And so I really put my heart and soul into that and um, capital, just wanted to capitalize on the talents within kids and help families realize their potential too. Because um, some of the situations that families are in, you know, um, they can't help, they can't always help their kids. They don't always know what to do. Um, and so that's, that's kind of where everything sort of started. And I really started connecting with a lot of different people who were um, focused on brain research and trauma-informed practices and um, building leadership within, you know, within students. Um, I ended up connecting with John Gordon and Nikki Spears, and, and uh, my school became the first energy bus um, school that, um, that ever, that, that there ever was. So I was the very first, we were the very first one, and that was very exciting, and that's when I realized that, that there's just so much more to school than getting them to the next grade and getting them to middle school and getting them to graduate. Um, it really is a place where we start growing leaders from the time they walk in as a pre-K student all the way up to when they graduate. So um, that's sort of been our mantra um, over the last several years of my career. And the more I can connect with people and learn from others, and, and I'm, a, I'm a classic researcher and, and book nerd too, and so, um, you know, I, that's just, that's just landed me a lot of connections um, with some really great people that I learn from on a daily basis. That's incredible. And I'm listening to this, I'm just like in awe right now, I'm sucked in. It's like, I just listened to a keynote presentation right there and you just, you laid it all out there and it was so powerful. I, I think, you know, you mentioned that you're a researcher, but I, I think what you just articulated is that it's stories that change people. It's stories that inspire. Numbers are good. Numbers help add the sprinkles on top of the ice cream, but it's, it's the story behind it. You know, you mentioned that you could have very easily become a statistic. Well, I'm, I'm here to tell you that you are a statistic because the, the power comes from those people outside of the norm. The, the real stories are the outliers. If you are in the norm, there's no story there. It's just the way it's destined to be, but you broke out of that. And I feel like that's kind of your charge. It's, it's what you're trying to do is you're trying to break the mold and either shift the curve to capture more or you are trying to really zero in and, and focus in on all of those other people that have been marginalized, forgotten about, or who feel as though they don't have the value that uh, maybe they see in themselves in the mirror or that society has placed upon them. And, and I'm wondering, is that where this whole joyful leaders thing came out from? You're, you're just trying to give people this hope and this inspiration and power, or is there something else that I'm, that I'm missing in your story? Um, well, that is... Um... That is a, a huge source of, of joyful leaders. It's sort of like, it started in a notebook and I just literally like doodled it and I you know, kept going back to it. I would just write it out, hashtag joyful leaders. And, um, and I didn't really know for probably six months to a year what I was going to do with that, if anything. And then um, it started to, you know, to hit me as I have the connections that I, that I was making that, um, that people did sometimes rely on the inspiration or the encouragement. If I, if I like disappeared from social media for a couple of days or a week, you know, just because of life, you know, things going on, you know, people would send me a message, you know, are, you know, are you still out there? Is everything okay? I missed your post, you know, that kind of thing. And, um, and even just, you know, not even as an educator, but just, um, you know, just as a, as a mom, um, as a, as a Christian, you know, as a, as a Christian um, person of faith. And, um, I, I, put, I try to put a lot of things out there that I feel like if someone, you know, um, were to read that it might spark a, you know, a different turn in their, in their day or even, you know, in their, in their life, you know, at that moment. And so, because I know that's happened to me, um, at different times where I've just come across things. And I really think that, Things like that happen for a reason. Um, I'm a big believer in in fate and um, and and God godly intervention too. Um, you know, for for people to be planted in in our lives for you know for a specific reason to teach us something um, or to help us realize something within ourselves. 
So, um, you know, the whole joyful leaders concept sort of, it sort of um, came from that. And um, I found myself writing a blog post about it, which I didn't think I would ever publish. Um, it, I didn't even put it on my website. It was in a Google Doc for a while. And I finally just thought, you know what? I'm going to push this out there. It was right after Christmas. I was, I was on break. My, um, I was refreshed and focused and, you know, um, rested. So I put it out there mainly just for like my brand, you know, just to, just to use my, for myself. But then what started happening is other people started using it and visiting the hashtag. It just kind of grew and it's not a huge hashtag that's going to trend, you know, at the top or anything like that. But, um, there are faithful contributors every day that push stuff through that hashtag. And those are the people that keep me inspired and keep me growing and, um, and constantly encourage. And I feel like I can give back through that hashtag as well. So it's, it's evolved over the last four years um, into something really cool. It's, it's fascinating. I, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I don't know how you're going to respond to this, but there are people out there right now that are, I feel like intentionally, um, I, I guess I'll use the word targeting, targeting that positivity. They, they're, they're calling it right. toxic positivity or um, yes. fluff or whatever the case may be. And, and you continue to do it with your head held high. And yet at the same time, you balance that positivity with powerful realness. I mean, it's not just all sunshines, rainbows, unicorns, and sprinkles. It's staying joyful in the midst of the change we need to make. How do you find that balance in yourself, both personally and professionally? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, and sometimes I worry about being seen as that person who's, because I have been told, you know, that I smile too much. I've been told that um, I have to, I have too much energy and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I would love to have more energy. <laughs> like I don't have enough energy, but, um, you know, I've been told by a few that I'm too much, you know, for some, you know, for some people or some situations and, and, um, you know, at first that can be kind of disheartening, um, because I never want to, I would never want to come across as anything other than authentic. Um, you know, with the things that I do and say and the way I affect the energy of a room. Um, but I think having a balance of putting out there that, um, that we all struggle and that we're going, that we're going through things that, that may, um, have us questioning our morals, our ethics, um, or even our practices, what we've always known or done and being transparent about that, I think is where that balance comes in, that it's not just about sunshine and rainbows, you know, that it is about, those struggles and the failures and, and the, the missteps that we take, you know, um, in whatever journey that we're on. And so I, I try real hard to share and be open about those things too. Um, and, and just listening to the stories of other people has been such a blessing um, to me because I, I'll, I'll have strangers sometimes that'll just, you know, or, or just quaint on some media, maybe Facebook or um, Twitter or Instagram that'll just kind of randomly, you know, share a message and, you know, say that, you know, maybe something is, was just what they needed. It came at the right time or, you know, um, just those little things that keep me going and um, that help me, that help me realize that it's okay to share and um, the not so great stuff too. Um, Absolutely. And to know that it's okay to, to rely on other people for support because I, I, I have grown um, into a very independent um, sassy kind of person sometimes. And I was that way as a kid too. My first phrase was me do it. Me would me do it myself. <laughs> so, um, you know, I was very, um, stubborn and strong willed, you know, as a, as a little girl, um, but also extremely anxious and, um, always uptight and worried. Um, I didn't sleep well. Um, I, I worried about everything, um, in my world. And I always thought about the future, you know, and I was, I was always thinking, what if this happens? What if that happens? So I had that going on, but then also this, um, this voracious will to be able to do more and be more from the time I was really little. So, um, you know, it, it has, um, 
I think sharing our struggles, and I've learned that over the last several years, and that it's okay to reveal some of those things from the past that weren't so great, and the things that when I was little, maybe I was ashamed of. You know, I didn't want to have friends over to my house because um, I didn't want them to see where I lived or I didn't want people to know that I didn't have enough money to go somewhere or to um, to purchase something. Um, so I, I worked from the time I was little. Um, I was eight and nine years old trying to find ways to make money. And um, and so I, I had a chicken business. I sold I sold eggs. I had my own little, you know, um, my own little, uh, you know, money, uh, money pit there for a while and from the age, from the ages of eight to 12. And so I kind of developed a, a, a pretty big work ethic early on with that. And my parents supported me with that too. Um, and so in spite of the struggles, I always, you know, always found a way, you know, to make things happen. And, um, of course, the older I got, the more I realized that it's, that it's not money that really makes, you know, somebody successful or um, happy. But when I was younger, I really thought it was because I didn't have it. Um, and, I, and I saw friends who did. So that was a big learning for me and um, trying to decide what I wanted to do in the future. Um, I knew I wanted to be a teacher from the time I was little, but I knew teachers didn't make any money. And so I always thought, what can I do instead? Can I do marketing? Can I be an accountant? Can I, you know, um, what, what will make me money? Um, and the older I got, the more I realized that that just is, I just have to be, I have to do what I want to do, <laughs> you know, and my parents really encouraged me constantly to do that. So, um, so I, I, you know, I kind of base a lot of my experiences and the, the way I share things, um, by almost, um, healing from, from the past a little mm -hmm. bit and facing some of that trauma that I never really faced in, until just the last five or six years. Wow. So, so if it's not money that drives you and helps you measure your success, what is it? And, and I feel like this could go, your answer is going to go one of two ways. It's going to go to that place where I'm going to look at you and say, oh my gosh, she is perfect. It's all, it is all sunshines and rainbows. Or it's going to go to some place where I'm going to be totally blown away. I, can you hear me now? Hello, hello. Hello. Okay, so that, that, was, that was epic. Um, for those of you that are watching this on YouTube, you're gonna see that, what in the world? Bethany just like teleport to a different place? Yes, she did. Um, <laughs> because you know when you're communicating from a thousand miles away, sometimes things happen and sometimes computers have to update and sometimes you have to run to another room and get a different device and it's all good but we adjust. Thank God we're all Zoom experts now and we know how to pause a recording. We know how to ask to come back into the meeting on a different device. We're good. So Bethany, thanks for adjusting and adapting to all of that. And I was just about to go deep and like get tears to flood. I think that's the thing. I think you know I was going to ask that question, that Larry King question that was going to get you all teared up and you just you skipped that whole thing to make me change course. Well played. Well played. Oh, I'll never tell. I'll never tell. <laughs> No, it's, it's all good. It's just, it's a real conversation, just like in real life, you know, um, it's like you're an administrator having a great conversation and the fire alarm goes off and you run and got to figure that out. Or I'm on the phone and one of my four kids comes and grabs me and says that he's getting beat up by his sibling. That's life. So yeah, we're good. We, we adjust. <laughs> so be before we had that fun, um, we were talking about success and you were talking about how you, you chose your career even though you realized it wasn't going to make you a lot of money. And, but you had to go where you felt like you were being called or where there was this person, purpose and passion within you. And I, I wasn't going to make you cry, um, I don't think. But I was just <laughs> going to ask, and I'm going to ask now, so what is it that defines success for you? Well, um you know, it, it is, it has been hard to talk about in the past, um, you know, coming to terms with some of the things that, you know, are considered to be adverse child experience, childhood experiences. Um, it, it's, it's hard to face some of those things. And I think sometimes it was more um, 
seeing the trauma through some of my students and um, you know the vicarious trauma that educators kind of take on from um, some of our students and that's really that's really where I started to almost um, you know withdraw from my own self um, I had a, my father passed away suddenly and um, that really sort of sent me into a little bit of a tailspin and um, the last year as a principal I you know I struggled with you know just some things that I had remembered from my past that I had blocked out and um, and and really truly realized that I had to, I had to come to terms with it and had to face it I had to heal from it and to start telling my story some too and so um, this is a little bit new for me I am just sharing some of the things that that I've experienced in the past and um, just in the last year have I started to push little pieces of it out there and um, every time I do it I find um, you know that I heal just a little bit more and so um, maybe the computer shutting down was a divine intervention <laughs> for, for me no i'm kidding um but i i do feel like um it makes me appreciate the little things so much more and um and that you know seeing educators right now and the stress level that that they are under especially classroom teachers um you know having to worry about teaching from teaching from um their home or teaching kids on site but also having kids that are home learning and trying to be a hundred percent for both sets of students um and 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 it's taking a lot out of them and it's taking a toll um and so just just the you know the the little things that we can celebrate along the way and that we can find joy in um whether it's a piece of chocolate or <laughs> you know something bigger um I, i've just learned that sometimes we have to just stop and enjoy those things and not take those things for granted even um, in my personal life as well you know just with my family and everything too so i feel like even though um you know i've made some career changes in the last couple of years and um you know my title has changed and my um you know my building role has changed i i feel like i'm just still able to influence um from where i am and um you know and 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 that, that it's really not about um the title you know that we carry whether it's a classroom teacher or um a paraprofessional or a superintendent or a principal um you know it, it can it can it can happen wherever we are um to be able to influence somebody in a positive way or just help them keep going and so i try so hard to realize that with other people when i'm interacting and um to, to really try to focus in on the struggle and whether or not they want to share their story is totally up to them but I feel like when I do get to hear someone's story it's the biggest blessing that could possibly happen um, because it means that there's a level of trust and um, safety emotional safety involved and to me I value that more than anything else in a relationship Wow well um, here I was making fun of you and saying, I was going to try to make you cry and you're, and you're help. one of the reasons I wear my hat, I'm wearing my hat forward today. I normally wear my hat backwards. So I wanted to be able to hide my eyes a little bit today. Um, <laughs> because I had a feeling you were going to go that route at some point. Let, let me just be a complete straight shooter for you right now. I'm going to tell you some things you probably don't, don't know. And I, well, I guarantee you're not aware. Um, about a year ago, I made the decision that during 2020, I was going to reach out to people that made an impact on me. And when I say an impact, I don't, I don't mean the people that gave me the a pat on the back or uh, made me laugh on a, on a rainy day, but the people that inspired me, changed me, and literally kept me here on earth and kept me going. And uh, I know you do not know this, but I went through a, a stretch uh, about three years ago where I was just filled with so much personal and professional self-doubt, I was, I was struggling in some very, very real play ways and found myself in some very dark places. And uh, I leaned on you and 
your story and the stuff that you were putting out there in a way that I don't think you understand. Um, wow. You know, I, I jokingly told you uh, before we even started going that it, it, it just took me getting the courage to reach out to you to, to record this. And it's not because I, I thought you were going to say no, but because I didn't want to just have a talk and say, okay, tell me your name, rank, serial number, and let's move on. <laughs> uh, I wanted to be able to have a conversation with you and, and just let you know that on a very real level, I appreciate you. You are one of maybe five or six people on this planet that I have not yet met in person that um, I truly owe my life to because of your willingness to be brave and to tell your story. And um, the fact that you have had ups and downs, that you've had those struggles, that you have kept going and you stay joyful throughout it, and yet you still hold on to this purpose and you know that you have a purpose and you know that you have a voice that others need to hear. Um, it's amazing. And I appreciate you. And I appreciate your willingness to just continue to say the things that need to be said, but to do them if, with such grace and such tact that you encourage conversation and you encourage and inspire everybody to keep growing and to keep going. So, um, I asked the, the, the loaded question, how do you define success? But I want you to know that you are a success, um, at least through my eyes, because I'm here talking to you because of you. So I'll throw that out there to you. <laughs> um, so well, thank you. I, think, I think it's time for my computer to, or my iPad to <laughs> disconnect. <laughs> no, <laughs> thank you for sharing that. That's amazing. And I, I definitely have people in my world like that too, that, um, you know, I, I've, I've felt, I've gone through times where I feel like I need to silence myself, you know, um, even, even, you know, some, not everyone understands the purpose when you put yourself out there um, you know, for the world to kind of see and, and, um, and look into, you know, um, what's going on, um, in, in your life. And, and, um, that transparency sometimes can be perceived as, um, something more, um, you know, boastful or, you know, a way of self promoting, um, or bragging or whatever, you know, that it may be, um, people can, can sometimes be judgmental that way. Um, and that's hard and it hurts, but, um, you know, just as, just as there are people that are, that are always going to judge and make assumptions on why you do what you do or why you say what you say, um, or share what you share, there are people who are holding on tight, um, to those, to those things too. And, um, those, those are the, those are the stories and the, the, the things that make me um, brave, I guess, um, to share things that, that may not always be received um, in a positive way by everyone, you know, because it's pretty easy to put something out there that everyone will love. Um, you know, um, it's, it's not so easy to put something out there that, um, that people need to hear, yeah. but maybe aren't ready for. Um, you know, not, not I would say the, sa the same thing is true in all walks of life. You know, it would be easy for me as a dad to just serve ice cream to my kids every single day, but it doesn't mean it's going to be healthy mm -hmm. for them all. It's the same thing for a classroom teacher. It's easy for them to, to teach to the middle and to just cover the curriculum without understanding that to reach every, they got to reach each. And I think that that's, that's truly, that truly is your gift. I feel like the words that you say are focused on the individuals, not the masses. And as a result, you've got a collection of individuals that resonate with your words and with your story and with your purpose. And it's, it's, it's growing exponentially. You are growing leaders that aren't just joyful, but are inspired and are purposeful and are passionate um, to go out and do the things that need to be done. Um, so, right in your, in your personal life in your, per, in your, not by, by personal, I mean, your, your circle, what keeps you grounded? What keeps you focused on the focus? Like when, well, like when we're done, when we're done today, when we're done today and you're thinking, oh my gosh, my computer crashed. I had the dog. Schmidt was crying. What, what's going to get you to, <laughs> <laughs> what's going to get you to say, oh, 
let's just keep on going. This was good. <laughs> well, welcome to my world. You know, um, <laughs> computers crashing, working. I have a son coming in and out, you know, just all, all kinds of things. It's very, it is very real. I don't have a this perfect little place to sit and silence and record things, <laughs> but I'm working on that. Um, I'm, I'm starting to work on that more. Um, but, um, you know, um, uh, keeps me grounded. I think uh, number one is my faith. Um, it, that is something that I rely on heavily. Um, and at times I stray from it, just like, just like anyone else, um, and forget to rely on it. But, um, everything usually brings me back to that. And another, um, another thing is my family. You know, my family is extremely important to me and, um, I rely on the, the family unit a lot. Um, you know, my family had, a, had some dysfunction in it, but, um, you know, the, the thing that I can be very proud of is I look at my, my two, um, children and, you know, I, I, I think that, Looking back in, on generations, there were probably generations of aces in um, in my family, and I can look at my two boys, and their ace score is a zero, and that's something that I'm really proud of um, because I've been able to, you know, with my husband, be able to provide um, a very uh, safe, emotionally and physically um, safe environment for them to grow up and to be successful. And um, that is something I'm extremely proud of. And, you know, it's not something that people would necessarily see or know about me um, just just by casual conversation or by, um, by looking, you know, at me. Um, but it's, it's, it's probably the thing that makes me the, the most proud and, um, and, the, and just the most satisfied with, with my status in life um, is mm -hmm. to see that, you know, I was able to overcome quite a bit. And there are people out there that, that have a lot more going on than I ever did um, that, you know, have even bigger and stronger stories than I do. Um, and, and if they can, if they can be brave enough to share those, then that's what's so powerful because it'll keep somebody else holding on, you know, um, it sure is hard. It's, it's hard to be transparent sometimes and to share some of the things that, that are kind of ugly. Um, but, you know, and it also can, you know, can cause, um, you know, people in, in, in my life too, to sometimes question and think, wow, you know, um, I never realized you were that you were experiencing that, you know, um, but it, it, it really puts a puzzle together. That's, that's, that's solid and, um, shows who someone is at their core, yeah. you know, and why land where they have. And so, um, you know, I, I think that's what keeps me the most grounded, you know, is, is just to look back on my, my, um, journey and see that, um, I've, I've produced another generation that's going to hopefully carry that on. Um, and that makes me proud. That's good. That's, that's good. That's powerful. And just for context, for those people that hear you keep referencing ACEs by ACEs, we're talking those adverse childhood experiences. Um, a lot of people are out there learning about trauma informed practices, um, social, emotional learning, Google ACEs, and you'll be able to see, exactly what Bethany's talking about when she talks about her A score of being a seven and the, the joy she feels in knowing that her own kids have zeros, you, you'll understand why that's so powerful. So look into that, um, check it out. It, it, is, it is powerful, it's powerful. I, I've got one more question before I ask for your mic drop moment. So, and, and they might be related, I don't know, but you, you use the term faith. So I'm gonna ask you really quickly. You said your faith is really important to you. Can you define faith what when you say that sometimes you stray from faith and i think it goes hand in hand with being joyful but how do you define your faith well um there are there are different levels of it and um, you know mm -hmm. first and foremost you know i i um, am a christian and i i firmly believe that um you know that there is a God, and and that He sent His Son to save us, and um, and I and I pray to that God on a regular basis, and um, you know use Scripture and um, 
you know, the word to help guide me. Um, I fail at that a lot. I, you know, stray from it. I forget to rely on it. Um, and just, you know, I guess like everyone else who is a believer does as well. Um, but I try, I try hard to remember that that is the biggest um, rock and that's what's, that's what will never go away. Um, you know, anything else um, tangible can, can disappear and people around, around me can disappear, but um, that level of my faith will always be there. Um, and then the, the, the second, the second level is just the faith in humanity itself and, and how that's really, um, become more in my face, you know, in the last six months, just seeing everything that's going on in our, in our country and across the world. Um, there's been, a, there's been so much, un, you know, unrest with, with health um, crises and um, social unrest. Um, to me, you know, keeping faith in being a good human is something that I rely on heavily and um, looking at the people around me. If, you know, if I can surround myself with good humans and people who, you know, want to invest in me, but also want to influence me in a great way. And, you know, and I can give back in the same way. Um, that's, that's a level of faith that, um, you know, honestly, I've questioned, you know, through these last several months when I look at, things going on in the, in the, in the country and how leaders are representing, um, you know, the type of leadership that we've been seeing. Um, it's, it's so hard to be able to describe that to kids, to be able to explain that to kids. Um, you know, <laughs> how, how, how do we, how do we share that, um, that it's not okay, you know, for some of the things that we've seen happen in, in our world? Um, how do we have those conversations with, with young children and with, with teenagers, you know, to, to have them realize that there is better, um, there's a better way. Um, and so just having that faith in humanity itself and the common good is, is something that I rely on. Um, and I, I always, you know, go back to, um, it's kind of corny and it's kind of cheesy, but I go back to um, Miss Congeniality when Sandra Bullock played, you know, in the, in the movie, and she was Gracie Lou Freebush and all she was is world peace. <laughs> you know, that's just that, I mean, that really is something that I just would love to see, you know, um, even if it was just within the, our, our country, um, just some peace and some, and some restoration of, of, just common good and treating people, you know, the way they need to be treated, regardless of any circumstance or appearance or background story. Um, um, I, and I just think that we have to get back to that. And I, I know I can't do it by myself, but, but by golly, I, I'm going to try every day. <laughs> and if I can push things out there that will, that will communicate that and um, put that at the forefront. Um, you know, I may be called corny or cheesy, but that's okay. Um, it makes me happy and it, um, it makes me keep, keep my faith going. That's good. I, and I, I appreciate you answering that question. I, I think it's, it's a fundamental question to who you are. I, and I think that everybody has their own definition of that word. There are some people that just have faith in themselves, faith in um, research, faith in science, faith in the religion, faith in other people, whatever the case may be. So I, I appreciate that. I love how you, you layered that on there. It's, what, what I get is the basic premise is things don't always make sense. Sometimes you look at things and you say, I don't get it. I don't understand why things happened this way, why somebody else allowed this to happen, but I believe it will work out. I believe that if I do my part, it, I will help contribute to things working out. And I don't know if I just paraphrase that completely wrong, but, but that's what I got from this. And I think that's so important for all of us to, to believe that we own a part in making things better, but we also have to have a belief that it can get better, even if it doesn't make sense to us. Even if we completely disagree with why things are happening, why that person got sick, why that person got hurt, why that law was passed, why that person said what they said, it doesn't make sense to us, but we can do our part to spread good and spread joy. So that's awesome. 
So I hope I didn't just steal your mic drop because I feel like you've got <laughs> something deep down inside of you that's on those same lines. And I, I told you ahead of time that on this, on this podcast, I, I try to wrap up every episode by allowing people to say, here's what I want you to hold on to. Of all that I've said, and you've talked a lot, you've talked a lot about school, your professional life, your personal life, your upbringing, aces, having hope, having faith, having joy, uh, career ups and downs, rounds and rounds, using your voice. I mean, you've, you've, you've brought a lot of truth and a lot of wisdom. If you wanted to, people to, to hold on to something you've said, or some bit of truth and associate it with Bethany. And they say, ooh, this is what Bethany said. And, and you walk off the stage with the mic just hitting the floor to a thunderous applause. What is Bethany's truth that you want to drop the mic with? Well, I think, you know, um, of course, I, I kind of separate things with, um, you know, my professional world and my personal world. But, um, sometimes those just go hand in hand. And I think the biggest thing that we can remember um, as educators and as contributors to our community or influencers, um, you know, we, we are all leaders, no matter, who, you know, whether we're in a classroom or we're leading a district. Um, and I, I think that we have to stay true to our core self um, and that decisions will be made and things will happen that go against what we believe. Um, sometimes we have to adjust to that and we have to, you know, make it work, but we can continue to stay true to ourselves at our core at the same time. And that professional pushback it's hard, it's uncomfortable, um, it's scary because you don't know how people are gonna respond to it. But I think it's something that educators have to keep at the forefront when you know something is not appropriate, not right, not great for kids, not best for families, community, teachers. Um, we have to share and speak up and find a way to be heard um, mm -hmm. because, it, it the fine line between, you know, being the one who constantly um, may, may be seen as a complainer or a pot stir, stir and the person who always pushes back and asks why um, something is happening. Why are we switching to this? Why are we changing this? Please explain to me why so I can understand. Um, I think that's sometimes seen as a negative thing. And we have, to, we have to get rid of that premise and that stigma of um, questioning um, powers that be, you know, people above us, whether it's federal leaders, state leaders, district leaders, whatever it may be, it's okay to push back and say, why? You know, explain to me um, how this is going to be better than what we are doing now, or how is it going to influence every kid and not just a group of kids? Um, those kind of things, have to stay um, at the forefront so we can be true to ourselves because um, you know when you veer off a path and you get down to um, just kind of following um, going not going against the grain so much just kind of following along it gets in that status quo um, you know position that it's hard to get out of and um, I, I just I just my biggest piece of advice is don't ever get too comfortable <laughs> mm. <laughs> because chances are um, you're heading toward mediocrity um, and you don't even know it. Um, Ooh, and so that. just as soon as you start to feel that level of comfort, whether it's being in a position for a long time or um, using the same <laughs> curriculum for too long or, um, you know, refusing to change because someone's asked you to do something different. Um, those, those things have to, we have to be real and true to ourselves and gut check it you know, every now and then and think, what have I done lately to make myself um, uncomfortable? You know, um, have I been disrupted? Have I experienced that cognitive dissonance that's required for, you know, for learning and growth and improvement and to be a better version of ourselves? And so that's my biggest um, mic drop, I guess, that I have. Oh, no, that, that was a good one because you've got me right now. I'm, I'm, I'm resonating on what you just said on so many levels. I'm resonating first and the level of a dad who I get so annoyed when my kids ask me why I get so annoyed with it. 
but yet I also have the belief that when they get older, I never want them to accept no as an answer, but I want them to listen to no now and just do what I say. But man, what am I setting them up for? I'm thinking about when I was a, a building principal in a central office, when I, I wanted to have these innovative leaders, I wanted to have innovative teachers, but yet I wanted them to follow the script. And what kind of hypocrisy mm -hmm. is that? Um, yeah, you, you're, you're speaking to me right now, and I, I appreciate that. So I'm, I'm hoping people are listening right now saying, hear, hearing this and saying, Bethany did not say go out there and stir the pot. She did not say go out and guns a blazing and burn the place down. But what she's saying is, ask the questions. And if you are a leader or you're somebody that has the ability to provide the answers, provide answers or at least entertain the conversation because that's where growth comes from. So, oh, you, that, was, that was good, Bethany. You, you got to me on that one. So well played. Well played. <laughs> So, so it's as late, you know, as leaders, especially as, as school leaders, whatever role that's in, if if people aren't comfortable coming um, to us and asking why, um, if if everyone is very quiet, then um, you know that that's that's a sign to the leader that something's up. You know, um, yeah. there should always be somebody kind of in our face a little. bit you know, asking, you know, them to, you know, asking us to explain something or, you know, um, even, even to just say, I hate this. Why are we doing this? You know, yeah. um, and talk. And that person that. might be above you or below be you. Free. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And, and we may, we may actually agree. We may go, oh, you know what? I'm not really sure why we're doing this, but we're going to, we're going to find a way to make it work for, um, for our situation, our students and us, you know, yeah. and, um, you know, we'll come out on the, on the other side of it better, you know, um, so we can show our own struggle in the process as well. That's so good. So good. So good. Uh, well, Bethany, I, I, again, I just appreciate you as a, as a person and as a professional, um, as a human being, I, I appreciate you. Uh, not just for the words you say, but for who you are, how you carry yourself, the things that you believe, the things you hold on to, the things that you are passionate about. I appreciate it. And I also just appreciate that you gave up an hour of your time to hang out with me and to share your message with so many others. For those people that want to continue to grow with you beyond just this time of listening and, and watching you, and for people like me that are too lazy to go look at the show notes, can you just say it real quick? How, how can people find you? Well, kind of all over. <clears throat> um, of course, Twitter um, is one of my favorite places. Um, I'm at Beth Hill 2829 on Twitter, um, and I love to connect. You can look at the Joyful Leaders hashtag too, um, because I'm always in there, you know, at different points of, of the day, um, and connect with people that are in that hashtag as well, because they will invest in you as much as you can invest in them. Um, I have a website, BethanySHill.com, and um, I blog every once in a while, not consistently, but I have, I have a blog on there and just different ways that you can reach out um, as well. Um, I um, have a Facebook page called Inspiration for Educators, and I just push different things out. Sometimes it's as simple as an image. Other times it might be um, articles that I've found. Um, anything that I feel I can benefit from, I try to share there because, you know, chances are if I can benefit from it, then other educators can too. Um, I try to share and spotlight people um, in my PLN who have um, written amazing blog posts or articles for different publications, um, you know, just to get, just to help them spread their message. Um, I love to be able to, um, you know, to empower other, other educator voices as well, you know, especially ones who are just trying to um, maybe blog for the first time or, um, you know, push something out for the first time and they just need um, that level of support, you know, to be able to have someone to share. So um, you can find me there. I'm on Instagram um, at Joyful Leaders and I have um, another have um, Bethany Hill one as well that I push personal stuff out on, but it's, it's a public um, profile. And so I love to be able to connect with people there as well. Um, so I'm kind of all over the place. I That's hope, good. I, I hope I can connect with some new people after, after this podcast comes out. That would be great. Absolutely. I'm, I am sure you will. So people connect with her. She will inspire you. She'll motivate you. She will make you think she'll, uh, she'll 
give you the tools necessary to, to make the world the place you want to, you want to be. So, uh, Bethany, thank you again so much for your time, your, your energy, your wisdom, and, uh, putting up with all the craziness that's involved with just sitting down and having a conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you. I enjoyed it. <laughs>